construction area over here. He's really good at that. Okay. Okay. But seriously, come see me if you have problems with those. I'll talk you through it. Hopefully it makes sense to you. Okay, so that's what's happening now with the charges of these guys. So we've got 20 amino acids, and all of them can be figuratively written just like that. Now, you took organic chemistry, and what did you learn in organic chemistry about stereoisomers? Well, hopefully you learned that if you have a carbon that has four different things attached to it, those four different things can be arranged around that carbon in two different three-dimensional spatial forms, right? You probably learned all that R stuff and S stuff, and I have good news for you. We ain't going to do that here. Biochemists are very simple-minded folk. They're very lazy. Okay, So we use a very simple designation called DNL, and no, I'm not going to ask you to draw what a DNL looks like, at least not here. All right. Why is that important? Well, that's important because if we take all the proteins of living cells and we break all the proteins up and we look and we analyze the composition of the amino acids that we find in those proteins, we discover something very cool. Every amino acid that we find in those proteins is in the L configuration. Every amino acid is in the L configuration. That means that living systems have selected L as the form of amino acid that they use. Now, if I go into a laboratory and I take a chemical reaction and I say, I'm going to make some amino acids, let's make some alanine, and I take and I use chemical reactions to synthesize those, I discover I get an exact mix of 50% D and 50% L. Biological systems have imposed a selection so that we have only L. So one of the ways we can tell if a group of amino acids has come from a living cell is if it has only L amino acids. Amino acids occur, for example, in, in um, all kinds of reactions in the universe. We can take a meteorite that falls from space and we can do an analysis on it and we can see in that meteorite amino acids that have happened, that have formed out in interstellar space, which is a pretty remarkable thing. And one of the first things that scientists do when they get that meteorite and they look at it is make sure, A, somebody didn't contaminate it. And if they determine that somebody didn't contaminate it, they ask the question, do all the amino acids have the same configuration or are they a 50-50 mix? Why? Because if it has a specific configuration, it came from a living system if it came as a result of a random chemical reaction, it is a 50-50 mix. Sadly, everything that we've looked at so far is 50-50 mixes. It should be a very, very exciting day when a meteorite falls from outer space and we find in that meteorite amino acids that don't have that 50-50 mix. Okay? Now, you see some amino acids here. Okay? These are not amino acids, so I don't even know why they bother to put those on there because they just simply confuse the subject. What should you know about amino acids? Well, I think several things. You're not going to have to draw their structure. Okay? You need to know the following things. You need to know the names of the 20 amino acids. If I give you an amino acid with the name of a hernium, I want you to be able to tell me that that is not one of the 20 amino acids. It's one of my fantasy amino acids. Okay. If I say valine, however, I expect that you'll say, oh yeah, one of the 20, that's there, right? I expect that you will know which category of R group each amino acid has. Which category of R group. And by the way, when you look in different textbooks, they will categorize them differently. We're going to use the categorization that your book uses here and not a separate one. Okay. So, here are the names of the nonpolar amino acids, at least some of them. Proline, valine, leucine, alanine, glycine. Now, what do they have in common? They have a nonpolar R group, meaning it doesn't have any OHs, it doesn't have any carboxyls, it doesn't have any amines, it has nothing in it that can ionize. It basically has carbons and hydrogens out there. Okay. 
There's five of them. Here's, here's some more. Here's four more. These are all also hydrophobic side chains. Nothing out there is going to ionize. Nothing is going to do uh, anything different. You can see in each case the R group is shown in blue. Okay? All the common features, there's the alpha carboxyl, there's the alpha carbon, there's the alpha amino, and there's that hydrogen. You see those are all common to all of these guys. The R groups are where they vary. So the R groups are where the amino acids differ from each other. They differ in their R groups. Okay, so we've got these guys here that are all also hydrophobic. So I've shown you nine amino acids so far that are hydrophobic. Okay. The next group we have are what are called polar amino acids. Now, polar amino acids have side chains that cannot ionize, that is, they don't make a plus or minus charge, but they do something else. What do you suppose they do? They form hydrogen bonds. Very good. Okay? So these guys form hydrogen bonds. You can see out here there's uh, an amine with an oxygen. There's another amine with an oxygen. In this case, there's an OH out here. They form hydrogen bonds. So these guys all have polar side chains. And again, you should know which ones fit into this group. All right, here's another group of polar side chains. Threonine, again, another OH group. Cysteine has an SH group, and tyrosine, there's another OH group. Now, I think you should know that cysteine has an SH group. We're going to see cysteine has some very interesting and important properties, and knowing that cysteine <coughs> excuse me, has an SH group is very important. There's one other amino acid that has a sulfur in it, but it's not in the form of an SH group. It's the amino acid methionine. And we'll see that methionine has other important roles, but two amino acids have sulfurs, cysteine and methionine. OK. Now, we come to the amino acids that your book describes as Acidic, and I'm not real fond of that term. I prefer those that have an R group carboxyl. That's what I, the way I like to describe them because it just tells you exactly what they have. Their R group has a carboxyl group in it. There are two of them, aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Okay? And they're very similar structurally to each other. They only differ. This guy has a carbon and a carboxyl. This guy has two carbons and a carboxyl. Now. For the first time, you see a side chain that can ionize. It is important, when I say you don't have to draw a structure, you don't have to draw the structure, but you need to know that these guys have carboxyls in their side chain. And what I've told you about carboxyls is they can lose a proton and ionize. So you need to know that this guy, aspartic acid, has three different groups that can ionize. It has an alpha carboxyl. It has an alpha amino, and it has an R group carboxyl that can ionize. And you could say, you might guess that each one has a pKa, and you would be correct. Each one has its own pKa. Okay? If you want a good thought exercise before and next time, I'd like you to look up in your book. And by the way, I, I took um, a finally got a textbook over to the library uh, yesterday. And they say they'll have it up as soon as possible uh, uh, to, for you to see. If you want to come and see one, come look at my book, and I can show you a problem and so forth. What I'd like you to do is have a mental exercise of finding a pH at which this guy, either one of these guys, can have a charge of 0. And yes, there is such a pH. So that's a good exercise for you to look through and see what's there, and you to decide what pH these guys could have a charge of 0. OK? OK. Now, your book in the next one uses a term that I hate, and it's called basic. And I only put it there because your book uses that term. I prefer to say that they have a side chain that has an amino group. 
We're not using the term basic unless we're talking about strong bases, and no, these are not strong bases. Okay. Now, this group includes three amino acids, histidine, lysine, and arginine. And it's a little hard looking at these, figuring out the charges that they can have, so I simplify it. I simplify it. I say, here's an R-NH2. And the NH that's important is that one right there. And you notice it's just an NH, but we'll call it an NH2 for, uh, I'm sorry, NH3, we'll call it for simplicity. Because we're going to call this one an NH3, and we're going to call this one an NH3, even though structurally they're not. If we were worried about structure, I'd say draw the structure. We're not going to draw the structure. But you know that that amine group can be an NH3 plus or a zero. That's very easy to remember. And so that's the way we'll think of these. This either has a plus one or it has a zero. This has a plus one or a zero. This one has a plus one or a zero. And each of these is in addition to the alpha amino and alpha carboxyl that we saw before. What's the maximum charge that any one of these amino acids can have? The maximum charge. I, hear, I see zero. I hear two. What's the, that's the maximum charge. Put all the protons on. That's the way you answer the question. So you put a proton on the, on the carboxyl group. What's the charge? You put a proton on the alpha amine, what's the charge? You put a proton onto the alpha, car uh, I'm sorry, the R group amine, what do you, what, what's the charge? So the overall charge, if you add all that up, is plus two. Make sense? Questions on that? Clear as mud? Is it Friday afternoon? Did you guys have a good week? Except for biochemistry, did you have a good week? Nobody had a good week? Did anybody get enough, that's not even enough sleep this week, I'm guessing, right? Did you have a thirsty Thursday last night? Who had a thirsty Thursday? You did, okay. They're going to hate you now, so. But you're here. That's good. It's not, it's not Friday morning. You know, if, the, if, if Thirsty Thursday is hanging over until now, you've got a, you had a, must have had a really good time last night. <laughs> Questions? None? Is this, is this so clear? I, should, I can go ahead and ask you guys a pop quiz? Oh, that's a question. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering if you'll draw that out. Um, Draw what out? Well, like you were talking about, like putting on or taking off protons, or like um, things being one above or one below the group. And I'm just having a hard time visualizing it. I was wondering if you could draw it. Out. Well, I don't have a way of drawing it out, unfortunately. Uh, let me talk it out. Okay. okay. So she wants to know how um, I can sort of in my head do the charges relative to the pH and the pKa, etc. Yep, PKA comes from a table. It'd be information I would give you. Okay. Yep. So I guess what I'm having a hard time is when you're talking about the PKA, I mean, I get it that if the pH and the PKA equal each other, um, then you're at zero, right? No, no, no. Or Big mistake there. No, no, no. What did I say? When pH equals PKA, I've got half and half. Half proton on, half proton off. Right? So if the proton on is plus one and proton off is zero, I have half of them have a plus one charge, half of them have a zero charge. And if you're talking about a bucket solution, that's the point at which in the graph, uh, that's the midpoint in the graph, right? That's that flattened out point on the graph. Okay. Yep. Okay. So if that's the, if at that, that point I said I really couldn't tell the charge because half the molecules have the proton on, half have it off. So when I'm talking about charge, I'm talking about